ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this presidential lecture of the Center of Financial Studies. When we sent out the invitation to this lecture, the reaction demonstrated what we had known before. Today's speaker, George Soros, fascinates people worldwide. Born in Hungary in 1930, he was confronted with two totalitarian regimes in a row. No wonder that Karl Popper's work, the open society and its enemies had a deep impact on him after he had fled to England. I had the same experience without uh, having lived only through some years of one totalitarian regime. George Soros is one of the big actors in world financial markets and he is a philanthrope out of conviction. He established Central European University in 1991, just after the fall of the Iron Curtain, <clears throat> created the Open Society Institute in 1995 and recently well known the Institute of New Economic Thinking, which just had its conference in Hong Kong. He has given more than 8 billion US dollars to support human rights, freedom of expression in more than 100 countries in the world. My own first meeting with him was of a, he's not aware of that, of a purely hypothetical character. Uh, it was shortly after he had brought down the pound sterling in September 92 and I, at that time I was member of the board of the Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, I gave a speech in London and just when leaving the room I was confronted with TV cameras uh, asking me, uh, Professor Ising, what is your reaction? George Soros has announced he now will attack the Deutsche Mark. Uh, and I had only fractions uh, of uh, a second to react. I did not want uh, to be seen as uh, not courageous, so I said, I invite him to do so, he will lose. <laughs> and I think you lost and later said, I will never do that. <laughs> Uh, but the DM doesn't exist anymore, so this is not something which is between us. Uh, <laughs> today's lecture <clears throat> is on how to save the European Union from the Euro crisis. Uh, Mr. Soros will give his speech, then we will have a short exchange of uh, views between us, and then the floor is open uh, to you. Uh, so, Soros, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I should like to uh, express my appreciation to Otmar Ising for making it possible for me to address you and express views which I probably in many respects uh, quite far removed uh, uh, from his. But I think we both agree uh, on certain fundamentals of which uh, having an open debate is, is a very important part. Um, uh, my objective is to discuss the Euro crisis. I think you'll all agree that the crisis is far from resolved. It's already caused tremendous damage, both financially and politically, and taken an extensive human toll as well. It has transformed the European Union into something radically different from what was originally intended. 
the EU was meant to be a voluntary association of equal states. But the crisis has turned it into a creditor-debtor relationship from which there is no easy escape. The creditors stand to lose large sums of money should a member state exit the Union. Yet, the debtors are subjected to policies that deepen their depression, aggravate their debt burden, and perpetuate their subordinate status. This has led to political tensions, as demonstrated by, this, by the stalemate in Italy. A majority is now opposed to the euro, and the trend is growing. There is a real danger that the euro will destroy the European Union. A disorderly disintegration would leave Europe worse off than it was when the bold experiment of creating a European Union was begun. That would be a tragedy of historic proportions. It can be prevented, but it can be prevented only with Germany's leadership. Germany didn't seek to occupy a dominant position and has been reluctant to accept the responsibilities and liabilities that go with it. That's one of the reasons for the crisis. But willingly or not, Germany is in the driver's seat, and that's what brings me here. <clears throat> what caused the crisis, and how can Europe escape from it? These are the two questions I want to address. The first question is extremely complicated. The euro crisis has both a political and a financial dimension. And the financial dimension has at least three components, a sovereign debt crisis and a banking crisis, as well as payments imbalances and divergences in competitiveness. The various aspects are interconnected, making the situation so complicated that it boggles the mind. In my view, it cannot be properly understood without realizing the crucial role that mistakes and misconceptions have played in creating it. The crisis is almost entirely self-inflicted. It has the quality of a nightmare. By contrast, the answer to the second question is extremely simple. Once we have gained a proper understanding of the problems, the solution practically suggests itself. I shall attribute a large share of the responsibility to, to Germany. But I want to make it clear in advance that I am not blaming Germany. Whoever was in charge would have made similar mistakes. I can say from personal experience that nobody could have understood the problems in all their complexity at the time when they arose. I realize that uh, I risk antagonizing you by putting the responsibility on Germany. But only Germany can get things, put things right. Uh, I'm a great believer in the European Union, and I don't want to see it destroyed. I also care about the immense and unnecessary human suffering that the crisis is causing, and I want to do whatever I can to mitigate it. My perspective is very different from the views prevailing in Germany. I hope that by offering a different interpretation, I may get you to reconsider your policies before they do more damage. That's my goal in coming here. The European Union was a bold project that fired many people's imagination 
including mine. I regarded it as the embodiment of an open society, a voluntary association of equal states who surrendered part of their sovereignty for the common good. The European Union had five large and a number of small member states, and they all subscribed to the principles of democracy, individual freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. No nation or nationality occupied a dominant position. The process of integration was spearheaded by a small group of far-sighted statesmen who recognized that perfection was unattainable and practiced what Karl Popper called piecemeal social engineering. They set themselves limited objectives and firm timelines and then mobilized the political will for a small step forward, knowing full well that when they have achieved it, it will prove inadequate and requ require a further step. The process fed on itself, very much like a boom-bust sequence in financial markets. That's how the coal and steel community was gradually transformed into the European Union, step by step. France and Germany used to be in the forefront of the effort. When the Soviet Empire started to disintegrate, Germany's leaders realized that reunification was possible only in the context of a more united Europe, and they were prepared to make considerable sacrifices to, to achieve it. When it came to bargaining, they were willing to contribute a little more and take a little less than the others, facilitating agreement. At that time, German statesmen used to proclaim that Germany has no independent foreign policy, only a European one. This led to a dramatic acceleration which culminated in the reunification of Germany in 1990 and the signing of the Maastricht Treaty in 92. That was followed by a period of consolidation, which lasted until the financial crisis of 2007-8. Unfortunately, the Maastricht Treaty was fundamentally flawed. The architects of the euro recognized that it was an incomplete construct, a currency union without a political union. They had reason to believe, however, that when the need arose, the political will uh, could be mobilized to take the next step forward. After all, that's how, uh, how the European Union was built. But the euro had many other defects which went unrecognized. For instance, the Maastricht Treaty took it for granted that only the public sector could produce chronic deficits because the private sector would always correct its own excesses. The financial crisis of 2007-8 proved that wrong. The most serious defect was that by creating an independent central bank, member countries became indebted in a currency they didn't control. This exposed them to the risk of default. Developed countries outside a currency union have no reason to default. They can always print money. Their currency may depreciate in value, but the risk of default doesn't arise. By contrast, third world countries that have to borrow in a foreign currency like dollars run the risk of default. To make matters worse, such countries are exposed to bear rates. In short, the euro, the euro relegated what is now called the periphery to the status of third world countries. Prior to the financial crisis, both the authorities and the financial markets 
ignored this feature of the euro. When the euro was introduced, government bonds were treated as riskless. The regulators didn't require commercial banks to set aside any equity capital, and the European Central Bank discounted all government bonds on equal terms. This created a perverse incentive for commercial banks to accumulate the bonds of the weaker countries in order to earn a few extra basis points. As a, as a result, interest rate differentials practically disappeared. The convergence of interest rates caused a divergence in economic performance. The so-called periphery countries, Spain and Ireland foremost among them, enjoyed real estate investment and consumption booms that made them less competitive, while Germany, weighed down by the cost of reunification, engaged in far-reaching labor market and other structural reforms that made it more competitive. In the week following the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the global financial markets literally collapsed and had to be put on artificial life support. This required substituting sovereign credit backed by taxpayers' money for the credit of the financial institutions whose standing was impaired. That would have been the moment to take the next step forward towards fiscal and political union. But the political will was lacking. Germany, weighed down by the costs of reunification, was no longer in the forefront of integration. Chancellor Merkel read public opinion correctly when she declared that each country should look after its own financial institutions individually, instead of the European Union doing it collectively. In retrospect, that was the first step in a process of disintegration. It took financial markets more than a year to realize the implications of Chancellor Merkel's declaration demonstrating that they, too, operate with far from perfect knowledge. Only at the end of 2009, when the extent of the Greek deficit shocked the markets, did they realize that the Eurozone country could actually default. But then they raised, they raised risk premiums on all the weaker countries with a vengeance. This rendered commercial banks, whose balance sheets were loaded with those bonds, potentially insolvent. And that created both a sovereign debt and a banking crisis, because the two are linked together like Siamese twins. There is a close parallel between the euro crisis and the international banking crisis of 1982. Then the IMF and the international financial authorities saved the banking system by lending just enough money to the, he to the heavily indebted countries to enable them to avoid default, but at the cost of pushing them into a lasting depression. Latin America suffered a lost decade. Today, Germany is playing the same role as the IMF did then. The setting differs, but the effect is the same. The creditors are, in effect, shifting the whole burden of adjustment onto the debtor countries. Please note how the terms center and periphery have crept into usage almost unnoticed, although in political terms it's obviously inappropriate to describe Italy and Spain as the periphery of the European Union. In effect, the euro has turned them into third world countries over-indebted 
in a foreign currency. Just as in the 1980s, all the blame and burden is falling on the periphery and the responsibility of the center remains unacknowledged. The periphery countries are criticized for the lack of fiscal discipline and work ethic. But there is more to it than that. Admittedly, the periphery countries need to make structural reforms, just as Germany did after reunification. But to deny that the euro itself has some structural problems is to ignore the root cause of the euro crisis. Yet, that is what is happening. In this context, the German word should plays a key role. As you know, it means both debt and guilt. This has made it natural or self-verständlich for German public opinion to blame the debtor countries for their misfortune. The fact that Greece blatantly broke the rules has helped to justify this posture. But other countries, like Spain and, and Ireland, had played by the rules. Indeed, Spain used to be held up as a, as a paragon of virtue. Clearly, the faults are systemic, and the misfortunes of the debtors are largely caused by the rules that govern the euro. That's the point I should like to drive home today. In my opinion, the Schuld of the sender is greater today than it was in the banking crisis of 1982. It may have been politically acceptable to inflict austerity on third world countries in order to save the banking system. But doing the same within the Eurozone can't be reconciled with the European Union as a voluntary association of equal states. The, there is an unresolved conflict between what is dictated by financial necessity and what is politically acceptable. That's the point the recent Italian uh, elections should have driven home. The burden of responsibility for the Maastricht Treaty falls mainly on France and Germany. For the course of events since the outbreak of the crisis, primarily on Germany, because the crisis put Germany into the driver's seat. This has created two problems. One is political, the other financial. It's the combination of the two that has made the crisis so intractable. The political problem is that Germany didn't seek the dominant position into which it has been thrust, and it's unwilling to accept the obligations and liabilities that go with it. Germany, understandably, doesn't want to be the deep pocket for the euro, so it extends just enough support to avoid default, but nothing more. And as soon as the pressure from the financial markets abates, it seeks to tighten the conditions on which support is given. The financial problem is that Germany is imposing the wrong policies on, your, on the Eurozone. Austerity doesn't work. You can't shrink the debt burden by shrinking the budget deficit. The debt burden is a ratio between the accumulated debt and the GDP both expressed in nominal terms. And in conditions of inadequate demand, budget cuts cause a more than proportionate reduction in the GDP. In technical terms, the so-called fiscal multiplier is greater than one. The German public finds this difficult to understand. The fiscal and structural reforms undertaken by the Schröder government worked in 2006. Why shouldn't they work for the Eurozone a few years later? The answer is that austerity in a single country works by increasing its exports and reducing imports. When everybody is doing the same thing, it simply doesn't work. 
it's clearly impossible for all members of the Eurozone to improve their balance of trade with one another. The Euro crisis reached a climax last summer. Financial markets started to anticipate a possible breakup and risk premiums reached unsustainable levels. As a last resort, Chancellor Merkel endorsed the President of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, against her own nominee, Jens Weidmann. And Draghi rose to the occasion. He declared that the ECB would do whatever it takes to protect the euro and backed it up by introducing first the LTRO and the OMT. Financial markets were reassured and embarked on a powerful relief rally. But the ju jubilation was premature. As soon as the pressure from the financial markets abated, Germany started to whittle down the promises it had made at the height of the crisis. In the bailout of Cyprus, Germany went too far. In order to minimize the cost of the bailout, it insisted on bailing in bank depositors. This was premature. If it had happened after a banking union had been established and the bank banks recapitalized, it might have been a healthy reform. But it came at a time when the banking system was breaking up into national silos uh, and the uh, banks remained very vulnerable. What, uh, what happened in Cyprus undermined the business model of the European banks, which relies heavily on deposits. Until then, the authorities had gone out of their way to protect depositors. Cyprus has changed that. Attention is focused on the devastating impact of the rescue on Cyprus, but the potential impact on the banking system is far more important. Banks will have to pay risk premiums that will fa fall more heavily on weaker banks and the banks of weaker countries. The insidious link between the cost of sovereign debt, debt and bank debt will be reinforced, and the banking union that would re-establish a more level playing field will become even more difficult to attain. Without access to credit on equal terms, the periphery countries can't possibly escape from the trap in which they are caught. Chancellor Merkel would, would like to put the euro crisis on ice, at least until after the elections, but is back in force with a vengeance. The German public may not be uh, aware of it because Cyprus was a tremendous political victory for Chancellor Merkel. No country will dare to challenge her will. Moreover, Germany itself remains relatively unaffected by the deepening depression that is <coughs> developing the Eurozone. I expect, however, that by the time of the elections, Germany will also be in a recession. That's because the monetary policy pursued by the Eurozone is out of sync with the other major currencies. The others are engaged in quantitative easing. The Bank of Japan was the last holdout, but it changed sides recently. A weaker yen, coupled with the weakness in Europe, is bound to affect Germany's exports. If my analysis is correct, a solution practically suggests itself. It can, it can be summed up in one word, eurobonds. If countries that abide by the fiscal compact were allowed but not required to convert their entire existing stock of government debt into eurobonds, the positive impact would be little short of the miraculous. 
the danger of default would disappear, and so would the risk premiums. The balance sheets of banks would receive an immediate boost, and so would the budgets of the heavily indebted countries, because it would cost them less to service their existing stock of government debt. Italy, for instance, could save up to 4% of its GDP. Its budget would move into surplus, and instead of austerity, there would be room for some fiscal stimulus. The economy would grow, and the debt ratio would fall. Most of the seemingly intractable problems would vanish into thin air. Only the divergences in competitiveness would remain unresolved. Individual countries would still need structural reforms, but the main structural defect of, uh, defect of the euro would be cured. It would be truly like waking up from a nightmare. <clears throat> Germany is opposed to euro bonds on the grounds that once they are introduced, there can be no assurance that the, the periphery countries would not break the rules once again. I believe these fears are misplaced. In accordance with the fiscal compact, member countries would be allowed to issue new euro bonds only to replace maturing ones. After five years, the debts outstanding would be gradually reduced to 60% of GDP. If a member country ran up additional debts, it would have to borrow on its own, in its own name. Having to pay stiff re premiums would be a powerful inducement to stay in compliance. Admittedly, the fiscal compact would need some modifications to ensure that the penalties for non-compliance are automatic, prompt, and not too severe to be credible. But a tighter fiscal compact would practically eliminate the risk of non-compliance. Eurobonds would compare favorably with the bonds of US, UK, and Japan. Admittedly, Germany would have to pay more on its own debt than it does today. But the exceptionally low yield on bonds is a symptom of the, of the disease that plagues the periphery. The indirect benefit Germany would derive from the recovery of the periphery would far outweigh the additional costs incurred on its own national debt. There are also wide, widespread fears that eurobonds would ruin Germany's credit rating. Eurobonds are often compared with the Marshall Plan. The argument goes that the Marshall Plan costs only a few percentage points of America's GDP, while eurobonds Euro would cost a multiple of Germany's GDP. That's comparing apples and oranges. The Marshall Plan was an actual expenditure, while eurobonds would involve a guarantee that will never be called upon. Guarantees have a peculiar character. The more convincing they are, the less likely they are to be invoked. The US never had to pay off the debt it incurred but in, when it converted the debt of individual states into federal obligations. Germany has been willing to do only the minimum. That's why it had to keep escalating its commitments and is incurring actual losses. To be sure, eurobonds are not a panacea. The boost derived from eurobonds may not be sufficient to ensure recovery. Additional fiscal and or monetary stimulus may be needed, but having such a problem would be a luxury. More troubling is that eurobonds do not eliminate divergences in competitiveness. 
individual countries would still need to undertake structural reforms. Those that fail to do so would, would turn into permanent pockets of poverty and dependency, similar to the ones that persist in many rich countries. They would survive on limited support from European structural funds and remittances. The European Union would also need a banking union to make credit available on equal terms in every country. The Cyprus rescue made these needs more acute by making the playing field more uneven. But Germany accepting Eurobonds would totally transform the political at atmosphere and facilitate the needed reforms. <clears throat> the fact is that Germany is adamantly opposed to Eurobonds. Since Chancellor Merkel vetoed Eurobonds, the arguments I've put forward here have not even been considered. People don't realize that agreeing to Eurobonds would be much less costly than doing only the minimum to preserve the Euro. It's up to Germany to decide whether it's willing to authorize Eurobonds or not, but it has no right to prevent the debtor countries from escaping their misery by banding together and issuing Eurobonds. In other words, if Germany is opposed to Eurobonds, it should consider leaving the Euro and letting the others introduce them. This exercise would yield a surprising result. Eurobonds issued by a Eurozone that excludes Germany would still compare favorably with those of the US, UK, and Japan. The net debt of these three countries as a proportion of their G GDP is actually higher than that of the Eurozone, excluding Germany. Let me explain why it makes all the difference whether a debtor or a creditor country leaves the Euro. All the accumulated debt is denominated in Euros. If Germany left, the Euro would depreciate. The debtor countries would regain their competitiveness. Their debt would diminish in real terms, and if they issued Eurobonds, the threat of default would disappear. The debt would suddenly become sustainable. Most of the burden of adjustment would, would fall on the countries that left the Euro. Their exports would become less competitive, and they would encounter sti stiff competition from the Euro area in their home markets. They would also incur losses on their claims, and, and, and investments denominated in Europe. That would include the target two balances, unless the losses were shared as part of an amicable parting of ways. The extent of their losses would depend on the extent of the depreciation. Therefore, they would have an interest in keeping the depreciation within bounds. After initial dislocations, the eventual outcome would fulfill John Maynard Keynes' uh, dream of an international currency system in which both creditors and debtors share the responsibility for maintaining stability. And Europe would escape the looming depression. By contrast, if Italy left its euro-denominated debt burden would become unsustainable and it would have to be restructured. This would plunge the rest of Europe and the rest of the world into an uncontrollable financial meltdown. The collapse of the euro would likely lead to the disorderly disintegration of the European Union and Europe would be left worse off than it had been when it impacted on the noble experiment of creating a European Union. 
So if anyone, if anyone must leave, it should be Germany, not Italy. There is a strong case for Germany to make a choice whether to accept eurobonds or leave the euro. That's the, call, that's the case I came here to argue. The trouble is that, Europe, that Germany has not been put to, to the choice and it has another alternative at its disposal. It can continue along the current course, always doing the minimum to preserve the euro, but nothing more. If my analysis is correct, that's not the best alternative even for Germany, except perhaps in the very near term. Nevertheless, that's Chancellor Merkel's preferred choice, at least until after the election. I reflected long and hard whether I should present my case now or wait until after the elections. In the end, I decided to go ahead based on two considerations. One is that events have their own dynamics and the crisis is li likely to become more acute even before the elections. The Cyprus rescue proved me right. The other is that my interpretation of events is so radically different from the one that prevails in Germany that it will take time for it to sink in, and the sooner I start, the better. Let me sum up my argument. I contend that Europe would be better off if Germany decided between accepting euro bonds and leaving the euro than if it continued on its current course of doing the minimum to hold the euro together. That holds true whether Germany chose eurobonds or exit. And it holds true not only for Europe, but also for Germany, except perhaps in the very near term. Which of the two alternatives is better for Germany is less clear cut. Only the German electorate is qualified to decide. If a referendum were held today, the Eurosceptics would win hands down. But more intensive consideration could change people's mind. They would discover that authorizing Eurobonds would actually benefit Germany, and the cost of leaving the Euro has been greatly understated. To state my own views, if they are not obvious already, my first preference is for eurobonds. My second, for Germany leaving the euro. Either choice is infinitely better than not making a choice and perpetuating the crisis. Worst of all would be for a debtor country like Italy to leave the euro because it would lead to the disorderly dissolution of the European Union. I've made some surprising assertions today, notably how well Eurobonds could work even without Germany. My pro-European friends simply can't believe it. They can't imagine a Euro without Germany. I think they are con conflating the Euro with the European Union. The two are not identical. The European Union is the goal and the euro is a means to an end. Therefore, the euro ought not to be allowed to destroy the European Union. But I may be too rational in my analysis. The, euro, the European Union is conflated with the euro, not only in a, a popular narratives, but also in law. Consequently, the European Union may not survive Ger Germany leaving the euro. In that case, we must all do what we can to persuade the German public to abandon some of its most ingrained prejudices and misconceptions and accept eurobonds. I should like to end 
by emphasizing how important the European Union is, not only for Europe, but for the world. The EU was meant to serve as the embodiment of the principles of open society. That means that perfect knowledge is unattainable, nobody is free of prejudices and mis misconceptions, nobody should be blamed for having made mistakes. The blame or should begins only when a, mis a mis mistake is identified but not corrected. That's when the principles of open society on which the European Union was built are violated. It's in that spirit that Germany should agree to Eurobonds and save the European Union. Thank you.